So before we get into this song, I, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think back. I want you to remember what he's brought you through, what he's bringing you through right now, what he's done for you, how he's changed you. If you feel comfortable, I want you to put your arms up and just thank him and remember those times when he showed up for you and know that he's always gonna show up for you every day.
Man, aren't you grateful that our God chooses to speak to us? And I think one of the greatest parts is that even in the middle of the fighting, even in the middle of the war, we see our God is still with us. Yes. We see our God is still fighting. Yes. And it's this amazing, beautiful phrase that we get to sing. As we look back, we press rewind on the, the history of our life and we see time and time again how God has moved and, and God has come through. And we get to press that rewind button and we get to look back and we get to say, though I'm dealing with this and though this is heavy, watch this, it is well. So I don't know if you walked in here with anxiety. I'm sure that somebody walked in with anxiety. Can we just take a moment? We've got a few minutes left in worship. We don't wanna rush his presence. God is in this place. God is in this place. So can you just close your eyes all across this place? We focus our eyes on the man, Jesus. We don't care about a song. We don't care about a band. We don't care about a, the words of man. We don't care about lights. We don't care about a room. We don't care about the name of a church. We care about the man, Jesus. So would you just lock eyes with Jesus right now? And if you're facing wave after wave of difficulty and things are coming up against you, anxiety is hitting you, depression is hitting you, why don't you just speak straight to your enemy? It is well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just feel like all over this place, anxiety is breaking right now. Man, God doesn't always move in the loud and the flashy and the, the ornate and the, the massive. He moves right here in these beautifully intimate, small moments. But I just feel anxiety is being loosed right now. It's, it's being bound right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, it's okay. I know it's a little bit low. That's okay. We're just gonna focus in on, the, on his presence right now. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Every single time, every single time, yes. You take what the enemy meant for evil yes. and you're turning it around for my good is he turning it around for anybody in this room right now you take what the enemy meant for evil and he's turning it around it all works out it all works out And it's amazing. God chooses to meet our anxiety in the, in the stillness. When there's a thousand and one things our minds could be on and we could be focused on, he chooses to meet us in the stillness and in the small. Yes. He's just asking us, push that stuff far enough away to where you can remember that before it was there, I was there. I was there and I'm still here and I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Come on, straight to fear, straight to fear. Come on, straight to depression, straight to every generational curse you've ever heard about in your family. seconds of praise. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. You're a holy Lord, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that because of who you are and your power and your love, your peace, your grace, your protection, your provision. Because of who you are, it is well with our soul. We don't have to fear. We don't have to give into anxiety. We don't have to give into the, the grips and temptations of the enemy because it is well with our soul because we serve a God who's greater and mighty to be praised. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, you're so good to us. Thank you that you're so kind, Lord, and patient with us. Thank you, Lord, that when we, when our eyes go on other things, that you're, you're, you're gracious enough, Lord Jesus, to gently get our attention again. But today we lock eyes with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that your presence be here and even when the music's over, even when we sit down, even when announcements go, Lord, will we be locked in for what you want to say to us today, Lord? I pray our hearts be in submission to your word, and Lord, I pray we respond to your word today. We pray all these things in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, can you look to the person next to you and say, it is well with my soul. It is well. Hey, if, if you know that the Lord's been good to you, can you just give a handshake, a hug to the people around you? God is so good. He's so good. And if you're watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. I just want you to type in, the, uh, even in the chat box, right? It is well with my soul. Amen. 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 Well, hey, welcome to Faith Church. How many people are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on. He's awesome. He's, he's worthy to be praised. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, if you're new here, if you're new here, can you just like pop your hand in the air, put it right back down? Come on, come on. Some of y'all like, I don't even want to, some of y'all like, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to raise my hand. That's awesome. Well, hey, we're so glad that you guys are here. We want to get to meet you a little bit more out in the lobby. Uh, you can meet us near the new here sign. And we would love to get to know your name, get to know your story a little bit, and see how you can get connected here at Faith. So, and we also have a free gift for you. So make sure you pick that up uh, after this service. We got two things that you want to be a part of. Everybody say two. Two things that you want to be a part of that's going to grow you in your faith walk but also uh, just push you into what the Lord has for you. Uh, the first thing is Grow Track. Everybody say Grow Track. Yeah. Grow Track is happening today at 1030. Every single Sunday we have something called Grow Track. Uh, this week is Grow Track 2. And uh, this is a way for you to get to know more about the church, but also how you can get involved through serving. 
okay? Sometimes we're on a bench in our faith and we need to get up and the Lord's called us to do some things and to forward his kingdom and we get to get up and do things for the Lord. Uh, so uh, that requires serving and, and you can find out how the Lord has designed you and made you through growth track. The second thing is in Christ. Look to neighbor say in Christ. In Christ, week two is today as well. That's also happening at 1030. And this is a way for you to grow in your faith walk, okay? It's a way for you to see where am I at in my faith and what's my next step in my personal faith. So if you want to do that, um, make sure to check that out as well. They are both awesome. And if you have not done it, you need to, okay? Uh, ushers, you can come forward at this time as we get ready for a time of offering. Um, I just want to uh, say I'm so glad that I'm a part of a church that gives generously. That gives generously and cheerfully. Because of your giving, we're seeing people all around the world transform and change for Jesus. But also, I'm also so excited to be a part of a church where God is doing something in the hearts and transforming and restoring people right here in this, in this room. There's people in this room that are being changed. If you weren't here last week, we had 36 baptisms last week. Come on, that's exciting. That's exciting. That's 36 lives changed for Jesus. Come on. And that's awesome. I'm so glad that I'm a part of a church where God is moving. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. I thank you that we, we get to give. We get to give to a worthy God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we get to give. And I, Lord, I just pray right now that as we give, would you bless the people in the community? Would you bless people around the world? People that we may never meet, Lord Jesus, but with faith we give, knowing that you're going to do more with it than we can ever do by ourselves. So multiply it, Lord. Do what only you can do with our finances. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. 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 Check out the video on the screen. We are believing God for some amazing open doors in 2024. Good morning, my name is Ashley and I just wanna welcome all of you to Faith Church. Today, we're in week one of our new series, Cultivate, where we focus on what God wants to replace and what we are to cultivate in our lives. Before your campus pastor comes up, I wanna tell you about a few things that are coming up soon that you won't wanna miss. Couples, ready to start the process of growing your relationship and deepening your connection? Join us for date night at our Somerville campus on May 17th, kicking off at 6.30 p.m. Get ready for an evening of laughter, love, and building a strong foundation in your relationship. We will have the authors of the life-changing book, New Marriage, Same Couple, Josh and Katie Walters from Seacoast Church with us. Don't miss out. Secure your tickets today at faithishere.org slash events. Faith students, Summer Camp 2024 is coming. Join us in Possum Kingdom July 1st through the 5th for an amazing week of worship, small groups, community, rec games, and more. Your student will experience the best week of summer at camp. Faith Kids, your summertime fun is also a few months away, happening June 26th through 29th. Your child will make lifelong memories as they learn more about Jesus and have a blast. To learn more and purchase your early bird tickets for both of these weeks, go to faithishere.org slash events. Ladies, Abide is this weekend, just around the corner on April 19th and 20th, happening at our Faith Church Somerville campus. This conference is designed with you in mind to uplift, empower, and grow your journey with Jesus. There's something incredible that happens when we abide in His presence. We will have the incredible best-selling author, dynamic speaker, and beloved radio host, Susie Larson, joining us, along with Sheila Harper, the passionate director of Save One Ministries. Join us for a time of powerful worship and the opportunity to connect with other women who are on the same journey as you. The cost is $74, and you can register at abideconferencesc.org. Hey, I just want to thank you for joining us today. 
God is not the author of confusion, so if you are here or watching online today, it is for a reason. If you're new to faith, scan the QR code down below. To catch up on all of our series, go to the Faith Mobile app or our YouTube channel. Now, prepare your ears to hear the word of God by your campus pastor. back in the day I had those little figurines I think Burger King or somebody gave them out no no you could collect all five grapevine hey, if you have your Bibles take them out and turn to John chapter 15 John chapter 15 man you excited to be in the house of the Lord today and aren't you thankful for what he is doing and who God is in your life and in your heart uh, for those of you who are new to faith uh, what happened in worship, just want to just give you a, a shepherding moment. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe that God still speaks today and alive and active through the gifts of tongues and prophecy and words of knowledge. And so we have one of those today. And so God would choose, according to Corinthians, to come in this place, kind of interrupt our service, and tell us how much he loves us. Aren't you thankful for a good God that does that? Uh, and if you have questions on that, we, man, Corinthians is an amazing book that will help you with that. Or you can talk to us, and we'd love to take you on that journey. John chapter 15. I, I'm going to try to move quick. This is one of my favorite, favorite passages, favorite teachings of Jesus in all of scripture, and it's setting us up for uh, our new series coming out of Easter and what God did. 36 baptisms last week, amen? Hey, I'm, I'm just telling you, with our encounter night that happened in January and last week, in our first quarter, we've had 105 baptisms. Man, God is, he's up to something, amen? It's good stuff. Um, and so we're excited about that. Our series uh, that we're starting is kind of answering the question over the next couple of weeks, what, what next? What does walking this out, what does walking this out look like? How do I become more like Jesus? And if you've been saved a while, it's a reminder, just a reminder to you that we're called to look and love like Jesus called to look and love like Jesus. We're called to mature in Christ. We're called to bear fruit. So what does this life look like, a life in the spirit look like? And, and I don't know about you, but I need those reminders in my life. And I'm thankful that Jesus is the gardener. He's the vine dresser, that he works through that as I grow and mature and bear fruit. So we're answering the question again the next couple of weeks. Uh, how do I cultivate the life of the spirit in my life? Stand with me for the reading of God's word. John chapter 15, John chapter 15. I'm gonna pick up at verse one. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear fruit more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Verse four, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Father, today I pray as we look at your word, this passage that's so rich, it would produce transformation in our heart and in our lives. And God, we just, we take a moment to pause again. Lord, we, we have no clue the, the magnitude and the things that are happening in the country of Israel. But Lord, we know that you love that country and that is your promised country. And so Lord, we just, we stand in kind of this, spot as the church of wondering, of knowing what scripture says and all of those things. But God, bigger than that, we know that there is a people group that are suffering over there. 
So right now we stand in the gap and lift up that nation, lift up that country, and Lord, we trust in you. We trust in you today. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen. As you're seated, tell your neighbor they look good. <clears throat> now, I wanna give you a little background on this passage, and I'm, I'm gonna move very quickly. Uh, but chapter 14, one chapter earlier, the disciples are hearing that uh, Jesus' imminent departure is at hand. He is leaving the world. And somewhat they're gripped with fear and concern and they're questioning. And again, we talked a lot about this on Easter. How could they go on without Jesus? What about his kingdom? So in chapter 14, he promises a couple of things. He promises that what I'm going to do, number one, is going to redeem the world. He also promises that he would return. He also promises that he would not leave them alone, that he would give them the Holy Spirit to comfort. And he would also promise that their confidence would actually grow as they obey his words and his commands. And so there's this picture that the disciples, that through this journey of the past three years of walking with Jesus, through this journey that they had been on, they had followed, but they're, they're lacking in the test. They're lacking in the spiritual maturity. And Jesus is now leaving and he's pushing them out saying, hey, you're gonna have to walk on your own. You're gonna have to do some things on your own. You're going to have to mature. And so in chapter 15, it's kind of like they're walking out, they're heading to the garden. Jesus is drilling down on what they must do as disciples to grow, to mature, to cultivate confidence, to, to, to trust in Christ and not fall victim to fear. And so to set this teaching up, to set this up, this first verse is so important, it's so powerful. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. It's the image of the vine and the vine dresser. And you gotta get this before we get to the start, you, you, you gotta get this that in their context, as Jesus says this one statement, immediately they're going to connect to pictures from the Old Testament. They're gonna connect this, they're gonna know what this means. Israel was always set apart, and, and the picture throughout the Old Testament, they were set apart to be a fertile vineyard. They were set apart to be a vine that produced fruit. And God had originally planted Israel in the promised land to be the means to, to, of the promise to the world. To, he had blessed them and multiplied them, so why? So they could be a blessing to the world. He had set them apart to be his extension of grace and mercy to the world and called them to be separate. But in both Isaiah 5 and Ezekiel 15, and, and again, his disciples would have known this, he rebukes Israel. They, they rebuke Israel for falling or forgetting, and they use the imagery of a vine or a vineyard that is not producing fruit, that is withered. It's not fertile. They're not doing what God has called them to be. And so now you gotta get this, Jesus opens with this in mind and the disciples would catch this and they would put the pieces together. He declares himself as the true vine. It's very important. He, he says, I, I am the true vine. I am taking the place of Israel. It's me, it's me. I'm the healthy vineyard that the nation failed to be. I am the vine. You see, the father had tended to this unproductive vineyard of Israel. Now he attends to the flourishing vineyard of his son. So this beautiful picture. And you'll see this all what Jesus says all throughout the New Testament. It's what he was constantly doing. He was bringing the Old Testament where Israel failed, where the law failed, where the sacrificial system would fail, where, where the kings fail. He's saying, listen, it all points, it all points to me. This whole book, it points to me. That what was imperfect, I am perfect. That what was unfulfilled, I'm the fulfillment. In other words, he's saying, I am true, I am true. I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So again, for the disciples, that's the backdrop, for the disciples to mature, they now, the, 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 he's imploring them that you must be attached to the vine. And this is different and it's revolutionary and it's a new Israel and it's a new church that is connected to me. And so that's the backdrop, just in that one verse in the teaching. And with that in mind for us today, I wanna, as we even open this series, there's a beautiful progression in these first couple of verses that answer the question, what is next? And so if you have your notes or following along, take them out. 
Um, number one, what is next for us? What must we do? What are some things that we are implored to do by Jesus to mature and to grow? Number one, very simply, abide, abide. It also just so happens we have an amazing women's conference coming up called Abide, where you will learn more about abiding and you'll be around. If you're a woman, you need to be there. It'll be a great time. Just shameless plug. It's still time to register. Get there. Abide. And it's happening this weekend. Abide. You got it. Abide. Again, Jesus, the metaphor for life, what he's doing, he says, you're to live in that branch. You're to abide. As a branch, you're to abide in the vine. Now, the Greek word here is meno, M-E-N-O. It's to abide in. It also means to remain in. The NIV says remain in, to dwell in. A, a better translation would be actually to take up residence or set your home in me. That's what he's saying there. Set your home in me. Set who you are in me. And so in John 15, he uses this 10 times. It's this command to abide, to set up residence in me. And the fact that he's saying it's 10 times, how we know in oral tradition, that's really important. That's really, that's really important. So again, verse four, abide in me and I in you. Branch can't bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the fine, so you have to abide in me. Now, there's also a phrase that's very important, and I can't spend too much time on this, but this phrase, in me. Is it okay if we do some teaching today? You guys, that's with me? Okay, in me, it's important. The entire spectrum, our doctrine of salvation is found in this phrase, in me or in Christ. You know there's only two groups of people, those who are in Christ and those who are not in, in Christ, those who are in the vine and those who are not in the vine. And so, so you may be asking, okay, how do I get connected in Christ? It's by our new birth. It's those who trust in Jesus for their savior, those who believe in him. And as you become a child of God, you are born again. You are a believer, a Christ follower, you're in the vine. And now you're a part and you're connected. Now you have to get this. In me is also a broader perspective in, in theology. It, it, he is pointing out the positional truth of you and me. Let me say that again. He's pointing out the positional truth of you and me. A better word for that is your identification. Your identity is now what? In Christ, in me. It's, we are positioned in, this is good. You gotta get this. We're positioned in Christ, your identity. So what does that mean? In Christ means God treats you and sees you just as he sees Jesus. That's gonna free you up this morning. Just as we start, just as you start this abiding, that's why abiding is so good because Christ, Jesus, the Father sees you just as he sees Jesus. Now, the word abiding is, is not just like one time even salvation in there, although that is important, that in Christ, that positional. It implies a continual communion or an ongoing abiding with Christ. A better term, maybe a constant flow of relationship with your creator. What does that mean? You get your heart and, 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 and that type of, in that world where they were at, the heart, whenever they said heart or soul, they're talking about your thinking, your feelings and your will. You get that core aspect of you. And, and Jesus saying, you get it in me and you stay there. You get it in me and you stay there. You're in constant communion. Now get this. Jesus is saying to these guys, and they're grasping this revolutionary teaching. He's saying to these guys, because what I'm about to do, I told you that one chapter earlier, I'm gonna redeem the world, because what I'm about to do, you can now experience the same relationship that I have with the Father. It's now open to you. Why? The Father and I are one, now you can be one with him. You can abide with him like I abide with him. You can see heaven on earth as I see heaven on earth. You can walk in constant communion because what am I gonna do? I'm gonna rip that temple veil from top to bottom. I'm gonna restore the journey of what you were, meant to, you, were, you were meant and designed for all the way back in the garden. I'm gonna take care of that. You can abide, you can abide with me. Now there's this language throughout the rest of these letters to capture this abiding or dwelling. Paul, Paul will say this word a lot in several different later, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians. He, he will use this term kind of pray without ceasing or pray continually or continue thanks or continue worship. And, 
And, and he's not talking about a 24 seven prayer where we're just on our knees praying. How many know that wouldn't work? Because you need to eat and have water and do those kind of things. You would die after about seven days of just praying. So he's not talking about just praying all the time and just being this, this heavy intercession. Paul is reiterating this constant need for ongoing abiding, ongoing constant communion. In the 15th century, there was, there was a monk called Brother Lawrence. In fact, it was one of the most read publications outside of the Bible. And he writes this publication called the practice of the presence of God. Let me say that again, because that's really cool. The practice of the presence, the practice of the presence of God. And he makes this statement in this writing, he's actually a dishwasher at a monastery. And he makes this statement in his writings. He says, I can hear the clanging of the dishes and the request and the requests and the longing for me to attend to, but Jesus is there. In fact, in that moment, it's just as holy as if I was taking the sacrament. He makes this statement of practicing, practicing the presence of God. In other words, he says, as you continue to grow in the love and joy of the Father, it invades every area of your life. You abide in him in every area of your life. Uh, John Mark Comer, I love him. He, He says this, abiding is our design and it's what we were created for. It's the communion and ongoing communion with Jesus. And he makes this statement, we were always created to have this kind of duality that you could be in two places at once. What are you talking about, Jason? He says, when you're eating breakfast with your family before work, you're in the presence of God. Now you're tracking with me. When, when you're commuting to work, and you guys know I have a weak spot for this, even in traffic, you're in the presence, you're in the presence of God. When you're doing yard work, I love yard work with my headphones and the worship going on and, 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 and I think out there, you're, you're in the presence of God. When you're running errands, you're in the presence of God. And he'd say, it's not multitasking, but living is the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's this shift, it's abiding. Now, some of you are looking at me weird. I get it. And, and I'm, I'm right there a little bit too. And you may be thinking, Jason, we live in a fallen world. And, it, and, it, and it's crazy. And you may be thinking, Jason, do you have an iPhone or a smartphone? Do you have a real job that is stressful and things going on? Do you have kids? I have all of those things. Have you seen the traffic? It's, it's all there. And, and here's the bonus. Here's, I think, and, and this is the application for us of abiding. Here's the catch. Notice Brother Lawrence, he says, the practice of the presence of God. This is what the Lord's been working on in me. What if, what if, bearing, what if bearing fruit took time? And what if this abiding needs to be really, really intentional? And what if it needs practice? You see, in our, in our world and in our culture and where we live and what we face, this probably, this, this lavish mode of abiding won't just happen. In other words, you and I aren't just gonna have the natural, oh, I just wanna fall into God's presence every single day of my life and in traffic. You're, it, it's not something that we do naturally. You know, we're, we're just over a decade into this smartphone and we're still trying to figure out how to be human with all this tech that's attached to our hip, with all this access that is there. Do you know that there are multinational corporations spending billions of dollars with the sole aim to, listen to this statement, monetize your attention. Their goal, listen, is to distract and then addict you. To monetize your mind and use your inability of self-control. To monetize that, to spend money on that. Anybody you ever, anybody just, you can agree with me that you just say, my mind is all over the place a lot. And only four of us, you guys are awesome. Do you have a smartphone? Do you have kids? Do you have a job? My mind's all over the place. And I will tell you, it's not just you, it's not just me, but how many know it's the time in which we live? 
It's the effect on the way our culture is now pacing us and it's the impact on our mind and our neural pathways. There's a, a secular poet, Mary Oliver, she makes this pretty, pretty powerful statement. She says, attention is the beginning of devotion. Let me say that again, because it's so good. Attention is the beginning of devotion. And this is hard, because I have ADD, ADHD, elemental P, QRX, attention. If she says attention, that's the start of devotion. In other words, giving something full attention is the start to be devoted to it. And how many know our attention is just robbed and it's a wonder we can't abide. This concept's foreign. This is a difficult time to follow and to abide with Jesus. And I love this line. And what I believe I'm, I'm just calling our church to, I'm calling myself to, it takes practice. It takes time. John Mark Cromwell will make this statement. He says, I have to direct and redirect and direct and redirect and direct and redirect. What does that mean? When I go squirrel, I have to redirect. I have to direct and I have to direct and redirect. And it's this constant thing of stuff lobbying for my attention, but God, I give you attention. Stuff lobbying for my wants and desires. God, I give you my wants and desires. Lobbying for my time and my energy and effort. God, I give you my time and energy for effort. And it takes practice. And the question I have just for me is, what if I started that practice? Then the heat of the day I mean, it's heavy and things are going on and boss is demanding and, and the kitchen's clanging and calling out to you. What if we practiced saying, I'm gonna shift my heart and my thoughts and my adoration and I'm gonna shift them on his goodness and his grace and his mercy and I'm gonna worship and even have communion and thanksgiving right there in that moment in the heat of the day. What if when things slow down, I started practicing at that stoplight, on that lunch break, that I shift my thoughts to him, to his goodness, to his grace, to his mercy, and I worship in communion and offer thanks right in that moment, right in that moment. Why do this, Pastor Jason? Because a branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Why? The, the branches, you're, you're not self-reliant. You can't be self-centered. You can't even be independent. What is he saying? There have, all these branches have no source within themselves. You were wired and created from the very beginning to live in communion with your creator, to worship, to have ongoing communion. And, be, and here's what he's saying, because of what Jesus did or is about to do, that temple veil is torn, access to the Father. I can now abide. He's returning us in this section back to original design to have continual communion with the Father. How do we mature? We abide, we abide. And my time is going fast. Number two, pruning. Although your neighbor say, I don't like this one. Let's tell him, I don't like this one. Every branch, say every branch. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch, he says it again, say every branch. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear, look at that phrase, more fruit. You're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. You're in his presence. You're communing with Jesus. How I many you know when that happens, we serve a good father that pulls junk out of us? that gets rid of stuff that doesn't look like him, act like him, follow him. He pulls that stuff out that doesn't belong. Now there's two moves here, and I gotta go quick. There's two moves here. Again, just the teaching on this. The first, the first move is there's no fruit from the branch. And if there's no fruit from the branch, it says he takes the branch away. I just wanna give you a couple of theological uh, avenues on this. The first is it's somewhat of a harsh picture that branches that are unwilling through maybe proud self-sufficiency or pride and, and they're unwilling to attach to Jesus as their source to draw strength from him. They're unwilling to submit to the discipline of God which makes them possible to change and shape and be more like you and to bear fruit. They're unwilling to do that. He's saying that there is no place for fellowship on the vine. Why? Because they limit the, get this, they limit the growth and protection from branches which are healthy. In other words, they're sucking the vital nutrients that other fruit-producing branches need 
So they're removed and taken away. Pastor Jason, that's harsh. Okay, that's one view. Here's another view. Some scholars believe that, again, they are walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're on their way. They may see some vines. They may see vines pictured on the gate, wherever they're at. They're walking on the way. And some scholars believe that Jesus in this moment could be just talking about Judas, right? He is calling out. Remember the the teaching of the disciples, and, and he's presenting this whole thing for all of the disciples, and there's a disciple right now in their midst that will not bear fruit, and he will be cut off from fellowship. There's a view on that. Then there's another view that says that the verb taken away in the Greek is the primary definition that it's used means to lift up from the ground, to lift up from the ground. So you have a picture that this vine dresser, I don't know, they're carrying the string and the pieces of wood and the pruning shears and they're working down that row of of vines and they're working down and they're carefully, as they work down, they're carefully lifting up the sagging branches that have fallen to the ground. And if they're on the ground, they can get uh, ants, there you go, bugs. That's what I was looking for. They can get bugs and stuff and pests. And so they're lifting that off the ground. They're getting it off the ground and they're pruning them and they're tying it up. Another word there would be to trellis, which actually translates, it's a procedure called training the vine. That's what the vine dresser would do to lift them up. Whatever the case is, he takes away what doesn't bear fruit. Why? Because the purpose of the branch is to bear fruit. He takes it away. The second move is he prunes branches that do bear fruit. Even the ones that are connected, watch this, even the ones that are doing well, that seem to have it all going together, he cuts back those, why? So they will now produce more fruit. The Greek word for prune here is katharyo, which translates to cleanse. I love that. I love that. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit that cleanses our heart and life, that he has that cleansing thing. So so he prunes, he, he moves into our lives. As we abide in him, there's this beautiful sanctification journey and process, this refining process, this ongoing cleansing. Why? To become more like him, to remove the things that are not from him, to cut off the things that are hindering your growth, to cut off things that are hindering your growth. Cutting off, lifting up, pruning all to bear fruit. Why? Because he wants you mature. He wants you growing. When this happens in real life, I have a picture. I don't know if we have that. If we have that, we can show it. It is messy and it is ugly. Look at that thing. That is a pruned, pruned grapevine, a pruned vine. Completely, completely Bear. And it's crazy, you don't just remove the part of the branch that are dying, you remove the healthy parts, you take it all the way down. You see, for this plant, this right here, to produce, if you prune branches back like this, watch this, listen to this phrase, when growing season comes, you'll get twice the growth and twice the fruit. Here's the catch. Pruning is ugly. It is messy. It is it is. Gross, but it's a necessary process for maximum growth to happen. Here's some maximum growth. Google images. Luscious grapes. Here's the catch. Every believer, you and me, come on. You have areas of your life that are at risk of withering and dying. That are at risk that that need to be cut back. And, And God will cut back the junk that keeps us from going. The entire idea of pruning, get this, is to allow for new and fresh growth in our life so we can become the people that he's called us to be. Can I give you a bonus? Because I love you. Just, just, I love you. I'm going to give it to you anyways. No one replied to that. <laughs> Here's the thing about pruning, pruning even for a new season. This is just a bonus, just a thought. Just take it Sometimes for me, I wanna keep what I had from the last season and take it into next season. I wanna keep my good stuff, my accomplishments, my my badges, the things that I did, I wanna stand on those things. And, And if I'm not careful, we try to live a life off the fruit of last season. 
And some in here, you, you wanna get back to an old season and you wanna stay there. And I, I get it, it was good. And God did a lot in that season. But what we don't realize that God is the vine dresser, that God is changing us and cutting away and chipping away ourselves and our pride and the mistakes and the motives. And you say, hey, la last year God did this. I was able to pray and he answered that prayer. I was able to, to go on a missions trip for the first time. I was able to, for the first time, start tithing and I, and I saw the fruit of that. I, I was able to pray for the one that Pastor Jason always talks about. And I saw that one become, become a, a follower of Christ and their life has changed forever and they've been baptized and the list can go on. And it's beautiful of what, again, faithful God, good God, aren't you thankful he answers prayers and he does that. But spiritual maturity says that you are now in a new year and a new season. And at this time, he just maybe not wants you going on a mission trip. He wants you to shave off the motives of your personal life and show you new things and take you and realize that missions is everywhere and get your head up and see there's a lost and dying world outside of Somerville that he wants to move you on and, and see a bigger picture that's out there. This year, maybe he wants to show you even more that he's your provider, that it's not only the 10%, but he's gonna show you how to sow seeds into that mission, sow seeds into people's life to expand so he can bless you further. You get, you get what I'm getting at? I don't think you get it yet. This year, not only does he wants to answer the one big prayer, but he wants to give you spiritual authority that everywhere you walk and everybody that you talk to, that the same power that raised Christ Jesus lives from the dead. So you are a child of God and you can operate in the supernatural and you can do miracles and signs and wonders because that's your identity. And he wants to grow you and mature you, gift of healing and prophecy. This year may, man, it may not just be about the one, but it's that prodigal son and daughter. It may not be the one, it may be the whole office. It may be the whole cul-de-sac. It, it's why, because your mission is to bear much fruit, more fruit, bigger. Amen. You see, here's the catch. I'm gonna say this because I, I love you, is that we never get pruned because we're picking up the branch from last season. That's what I did. And this is when it was great. And so we kind of spiritually check out and we never receive fresh vision. We never receive fresh calling for the new season. God is a God of seasons and he wants to take you to a new place with new growth, with new maturity and a new branch that will bear more fruit. But all we do is complain about the old branch. God wants new growth in your life. Can I just let you know, 2023 was a great year, but it's over. Maybe drill down a little bit more. The 80s are over. I know the clothes are coming back, but, but the 80s are over. Come on, he's the gardener, the pruner, and he's constantly looking. Are we open to let him cut away those things that shouldn't be in there to cleanse us? So why? So we can bear more fruit for his glory. Just don't live in last season. Don't live in last season. Pruning process is done by an experienced gardener, a good father who knows exactly what he's doing and he loves to prune us to bear more fruit for his glory. That was a bonus, all right. Pastor Jason, how does this happen? How does pruning happen? How does, how does this cleansing process happen? Verse three, you are already cleaned because of the word that I have spoken to you. The author of Hebrews would echo it in verse 12, a familiar passage. For the word of God is living and active and it's sharper, it's a pruning knife. It's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This word of God, this word of God is that knife, it's the pruning. It's used by the gardener, the gardener to cut away the carnal and evil stuff in our life. The word is the light, why? Because it convicts and it cleanses us. You see, as you abide in his presence, as you allow for pruning and discipline and repentance and, and cleansing in your life, this word becomes a mirror and it literally convicts and it cleanses me. And so the question, are we in this word, open to this word, and open to the Lord, removing things, watch this, even if it's hurtful and painful, removing it. Why? So I can do what he's designed me for, to bear fruit. Which leads us to number three, bear fruit. Abide in me, 
And I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Look at this phrase, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse eight, by this abiding, by this bearing, verse eight says, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. See, as we abide, as we allow for the pruning, the natural product is we bear fruit. Here's just another side bonus extra. I, I, I love the statement that apart from me, you can do nothing. I love it because it takes the pressure off. Apart from me, you can do nothing. No amount of ingenious planning, no amount of restless activity, listen to me, can produce spiritual fruit. I love it because often you and I assume that producing fruit is, is like James, is, is like the works. Producing fruit or bearing fruit is my work, my responsibility, something that I must do now. And so what happens, I don't know about you, but with me, I strive to produce and I fail. I, I pick myself up and what do I do? I promise to bear more fruit and to do it better and to produce more. And I continue on a horrible cycle of feeling inadequate like a failure. The requirement is to abide. Don't free you up. The requirement is to abide. And the product of just being in his presence is that you will bear much fruit. It's the natural thing of spending time with Jesus and communing with Jesus and you will love what he loves. You will pursue what he pursues. His heart will become your heart. People will become your heart. This thing starts to happen, to abide. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now Jesus, just real quick, he, he tells us what happens when we abide, when, we get, when, when we're in that constant communion, he tells us some of the characteristics of fruit. What does some of this fruit look like? And this, by the way, is what we're gonna spend our entire next couple of weeks on the series. We're gonna move to Galatians chapter five, and we're gonna be in that for, the, for our rest for a couple of weeks. So I, I wanna, but I wanna close, just finish this passage out, close with four quick things, very quick, that we're going to spend time on the rest of the series. As you abide, it produces spiritual authority. As you abide as you, in constant communion, it produces spiritual authority. Prayers are answered, why? Because you pray like Jesus. Look at verse seven, some of you looking at me weird. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Amen. Spiritual authority. This is not suggesting that God becomes our cosmic Santa Claus. This is, this, is not, this is not suggesting that. The promise though is conditional, that if you abide, this will be the fruit. As you have relationship, as you're connected to the vine, what happens? You become more like Jesus, what happens? You receive the same relationship that he has with the Father, what happens? Jesus receives all the authority from the Father, they're one, they're aligned in complete constancy and consistency, so as you abide, you align with Jesus and you get that same authority. Remember, you're in Christ, you're in Christ. Your Listen, if you're abiding, can I just, your prayers have power. Your, your prayers have power. You mix that with a little bit of faith and God moves mountains. Your prayers have power, power. As you abide, it produces authority. As you abide, number two, it, it produces an attitude of worship. God is glorified. You worship the Father like Jesus worships the Father. Look, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and you prove to be my disciples. By, watch this, by this abiding, this authority that you now walk in, how many know, how many can't wait? Miracles are gonna take place, prayers are being answered, that starts to happen. We start to model the character of Jesus. You glorify him because he gets the credit. This is, this is what happens. And because the authority comes from him, you're, you're created, I don't know if you know this, to give God glory. So again, he's taking us back to our original design. By walking and praying and communion with me, you're gonna flow into a life of worship and communion and, I, and he gets all the credit. It's your design. God delights in you and I reflecting his character. 
It's what, it's what we're created for. All right, you worship. As you abide, you, you got authority, you, you worship. As you abide, it produces love. And the next two, three, and four, we're gonna spend our whole, whole time on next week, so I can't spend too much time on it, but you love. You, you love what he loves. Look at this. As the Father loved me, so as I loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Look at all that language. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lays down life for their friends. Again, as we abide, because of the character of Jesus becomes our character, watch this, because God is love, come on. God is love, it's who he is. Now that is resting in me and about me. Look, he's getting ready to leave his disciples and he's repeating the greatest commandment. He's repeating the most important thing. He's saying, guys, love God and love others. By the way, this is your fruit. This is how you know that you're following me. This is how you know that you're connected to me because my love for humanity will flow out of you. Love. As you abide, it produces authority, it produces worship, it produces love. As you abide, lastly, and again, we're spending a lot of time on this next week, it produces joy. Contentment and purpose overflows when you abide in the presence of God. Contentment and purpose overflows when you abide in the presence of God. Look at this verse. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And you know this joy, it's not superficial happiness. It's a deep contentment that, that transcends circumstance. It's abiding in the vine. You find that contentment and that joy. Listen to me, it, it comes from a place of complete security and complete confidence in the vine, in the garden. Even in the midst of testing and trial, it's my fruit. That fruit is that attitude and it changes into resolve that I'm living for something bigger than me. And watch this, there's a joy knowing Jesus and abiding in him, bearing fruit. These four things just, again, I don't have much time, but these four things, it's a litmus test. It's, it's a test. What do you mean, Pastor Jason? How, how would I know that you're abiding in the vine and you're walking with authority? You understand that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. You're praying with power and authority. And when, when you don't know what to pray, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you, taking residence in you in this beautiful relationship with the Holy Spirit. This, this ongoing thing comes out of you. And how do, how do I know you're connected to the vine? And you love worship. You love not just singing, but you love living a life of worship. You're, you understand that your life and everything you say and everything you do is to bring glory to your creator. You start to understand and grasp that concept. How do I know that you're connected to the vine? Is that you love. And this is difficult in our world that is based on conditions. You love. And you don't see people through a jaded lens. You see people how Jesus sees them. And it's not just even your neighborhood, it's not just your Jerusalem, but it's Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And you have this, this thing stirs up inside of you that when a mission team goes to Salzburg, you're in tears because of what they're doing and how the gospel is being shared around the world. And your heart starts to move for the things that Jesus, that, that three billion people are dying and going to hell right now. And your heart, it's in there and it's convicted. And it's just, you wake up thinking about it. I gotta see more people come to Jesus. I love them. It's a fruit of abiding in the vine. And I got joy in the middle of trials, in the middle of tests. And people are asking you, Tom, why are you so happy? Look at what's happening in Israel. Look what's happening over here. Look at what's going on over here. What, I, man, I have a resolve. I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he is on the throne. What he says is yes and amen and he's the Alpha and the Omega. And so my hope and my trust is in him.
connected, connected to him. It's the litmus test. You see, when we abide, when we allow pruning, Jesus literally flows through us. And this fruit is the product of authority, worship, love, and joy. Paul says it in his version of John chapter 15 this way. Galatians 5 verse 16. But I say walk by the Spirit. In other words, be connected to the vine, abide, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, the product of that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, those who are connected to the vine, who are abiding, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step, abide in me and I in you, and you will bear fruit. You see, the challenge for the disciples was to mature and to grow, and, and what's next, and what does a spiritual life look like? Abide, allow pruning, and bear fruit. As we close this morning, and I know it's been quick and fast, but as, as we close this morning, just a couple of things. Maybe, maybe you'd say, listen, just and we, we, do, we will do this every week, but maybe you'd say, hey, I'm not connected to the vine. I'm, 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 I'm not there. I don't know my purpose. I don't know my value. And you've been trying to find purpose and value everywhere else, connecting to all other things in your life. You could have been anywhere else in the world, but God brought you here to tell you that he is madly in love with you. Romans 11, it uses this really cool phrase. And again, I'm on time, but it, he talk, he's talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. And, and he's literally saying, you have been grafted into the vine. I think that's a beautiful picture of salvation and where, where our testimony and our story was. He literally grafts us, which means in a dormant season, they would cut a section away and wrap it around and tie it together. And now that twig becomes a part of that tree and literally has a new identity and a new purpose to to bear fruit. That's what he does with us. He does that with us. You say, Pastor Jason, I'm not where I should be. I'm not connected to the vine. Maybe you're here this morning, just the second thing, and this is where I find myself, is that you're distracted. And abiding hasn't really been that practice in your life. And there's some things, if you're honest, that you need to adjust and change. And again, we're gonna address this on a weekly basis. It's difficult in our world with the things pulling at us. But today, if you're honest, you'd say, Pastor Jason, I need to make some shifts in my life, in my life to abide, to live in that duality, to live in that presence, to recognize that whatever I do and work and deed, I'm doing it for the glory of God. I'm in his presence. And if that's you, what I would like as we pray and as we worship in just a moment, can we allow the Lord to do a searching a pruning, to pull some stuff out of us, to say, God, I want you to bring things to the surface. Where is my anger? Where is my frustration? Where is my lust? Where are those temptations? Where are those things that I've excused as my personality or just who I am? Where are those things that you need to pull out of me? And am I open to allow the pruning? And here's the cool part. I don't, here's the cool part, as we pull that out, God puts us in a body of Christ where we will sh literally sharpen one another. It's iron sharpens iron. And, and that's a hard process for someone to say, hey, that's not right. Hey, Larry, you gotta pull that out of your life. I see that in you, are you open? And when somebody says that as our response, you know what, can you pray for me? Is there, what are you talking about, Pastor Jason? You got this. I. I are we defensive? So this pruning process takes us, first of all, Holy Spirit, search me, test me, pull this stuff out, God, and then put people in my life that are gonna sharpen me and grow me and make me more like you. And God, help me to be open to that. Why? Because I wanna bear fruit. Because Jesus is coming back and I wanna serve him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Can we allow the Lord to do that? To do some pruning? I don't wanna live on yesterday's. I don't wanna live on last seasons. Come on, I need a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit today, right now, today in my heart, in my life. And then lastly, just very practically, and I just wanna get honest, 
because I, I'm into the nature that if, if we just preach these kind of etherical things, but it doesn't affect Tuesday or Wednesday, we're missing the point. So just some practical things with, with your distraction. We talked a lot about this last fall, but do you Sabbath well? Do you rest? Do you do that? John Mark Comer has a line that he says, I put my phone and my screen to bed before I go to bed. I plug it in and put it in a drawer and I shut the drawer. Pastor Jason, my alarm clock, I will buy you an alarm clock if you need one. There's $7 at Walmart, get one, put it on your thing. But what happens is we are on social media all the way through the night, all the way through the evening, looking at things, scrolling through things, buying things, doing bills. And, and we go to bed like that with that anxiety weighing on us, never communing or abiding in the Lord before we rest. We wonder why we can't sleep. And we wonder why these things are, put your phone to bed. I, my wife and I are gonna do this. And I, this is just my conviction, but she's gonna have she already has my screen lock and all those things, but she's gonna have access to things that suck my life on my phone. She's gonna, all right, buddy, you get 30 minutes. And when that thing's up, you're done. Stop looking on Facebook market, searching for old cars. We are good. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> and it will shut down. And if it shuts down and it's 10 o'clock, I don't get social media for the rest of the day. You need to treat me like a 12 year old. I don't do it. Why? Because it's not good for me and it's affecting my abiding. What, what measure are you willing to take so you bear fruit? Again, the pressure's not on us, it, we just need to abide. So what's stopping you from practicing that? What's getting in that? And can we be intentional? And can we cut that off? And can we say, God, I surrender it. I surrender it to you. Put your phone to bed. Let's let the Lord cut some things, some of those distractions out. Why? because I need his voice, I need his heart. I need him to speak to me. I need to wake up in the morning. John Mark Cromer said, I won't touch my phone for the first hour, for the first hour. I'm not gonna touch it, why? Because I gotta meditate on scripture. I gotta hear the word and see the word and pray and pray in my heavenly language. I gotta get that first before that junk, before that junk. Bye, heads and close your eyes with me. Father, today I thank you for your word. And I thank you that you're here. I thank you for this beautiful calling of taking us back to design, taking us back how you wired us to walk with you, to commune with you in the cool of the day. God, I pray that, Lord, it's such a, such a sometimes a burden and, and, and a conviction and a weight. But God, I, I thank you that your grace is sufficient. God, I thank you that your mercy is new. I thank you that you are here. I thank you that you are a, a good father. Good father who cares, whose desire is purpose and life in abundance. And so today I pray in these next few moments, God, we can just get so busy being busy. God, I pray that as we talk about these things in the next couple of weeks, God, as we start to re-engage as we take some steps towards spiritual maturity, God, that you would quicken us. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son and the gift of your Spirit lives inside of us. Real quick, if you're in here with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Pastor Jason, I'm, I'm not in the vine. I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. I've been running my own thing. I've been doing my own thing. I've been pursuing my stuff. I'm not connected to him. I need, to make, I need to make it right this morning. I need to surrender lordship to him. If that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, just so I know, can you slip up your hand and look at me so I know who to pray for? Amen. 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 Maybe you're in here today and you say, Pastor Jason, I've just been distracted. It's been just a busy season. This abiding, it's, it's been a minute. I just need a fresh touch from the Lord, a fresh touch from the Spirit. I just need, I need an awakening today. I need 
need to shift some of my priorities. If that's you, can you raise your hand and look at me? Amen. 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 You stand to your feet with me. Our altar team's coming now. Again, we say this every week. We have a, a wonderful team up here to journey along with you. And if you raise your hand for one or two of those things and just say, hey, I need to surrender some stuff to the Lord. I need to let go of some distractions. We have a wonderful team that just wants to pray over you. And we take this moment to bear one another's burdens. To do that, we release that at the feet of Jesus. And there's something about this prayer that's very important in surrender. So if you raise your hand and, and if you need that, this group is here. And then number two, I'm just gonna ask if you hang out for just a minute. We're just gonna worship a couple times through. I know we went a little longer today, but as we worship, can you take a moment and just just pray this prayer to the Lord? God, show me the stuff. Show me the things in my life that aren't where they should be. God, pull that stuff out of me. That prayer of Psalms 139, search me, God. Search me, God. Know my anxious spots. Know the place that I worry. Know the stuff, that sinful stuff that you need to pull out. And God, I commit, I commit to let that go and to surrender today. So in this time of worship, we're gonna glorify the name of Jesus. And can we ask God for a search? Come on, one more time. Father, today, right here in these next few moments, God, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts and lives. God, that you would do something in us. God, we want more of you in our heart. God, not, not for our own sake, but God, we, we wanna live out the purpose of what you've designed us for. So God, in these next few moments, I pray that you'd have your way in our heart and life. We love you, Jesus. this room and can we can we pray that this week we abide in the Lord that was such a powerful word Lord Jesus we just come before you right now we just say thank you thank you for this word thank you for your word that shows us how to bear fruit how we bear fruit is simply by abiding in you Lord will we not just abide on Sunday in the midst of a church Lord but will we learn how to abide in our homes we learn how to abide in the car, Lord, on our way to uh, the things we have to do. Will we learn how to abide before we go to sleep, when we wake up in the morning? Will we abide in you this week? And through abiding in you, will we bear much fruit? We pray all these things in your name. Amen. 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 Well, hey, guys, we love you guys so much. Once again, do not leave if you need prayer. Uh, once again, uh, do not leave if you need prayer. We got road track and ink price happening, so make sure you do that. But also, youth is tonight. So if you have a middle schooler, high schooler, make sure they're at youth tonight. And we will see you next week as we can, uh, continue our sermon series, Cultivate. Love you guys, and have a great day.